I'm gonna reveal to you all of the secrets I use to beat top 100 Grandmaster in the entire world as black here. Absolutely fantastic game and what's even more important, so instructive that you can use the lessons from here immediately to improve your game and beat everyone around you. What's up chess player and welcome to the journey to Grandmaster, the place where you can improve every single aspect of your chess game. I have played this game as black against Alan Pichot. You can see that uh, I have a 2950 rating and he has 2850. So a very small difference, well, but a huge result for me as I have won against the Super Grandmaster and I'm ready to share it with you. The game started with the Philidor defense, which is of course my favorite opening against the E4. And here it started with a move e5. Now white has a few choices either to take and go into the end game, which also a very, very good one for black. I enjoy playing it a lot, but my opponent played knight 2 and that is a very interesting setup, not the main line knight f3, which of course I know a lot of theory about, but just trying to, to go away from the main lines. The top players are making that so often because they don't want just to, to run into some 30 moves, theoretical variation with you, they don't want to play against computer. They think they play stronger than you and normally they do. So they want just to remove the entire theory away and play some uh, less known variations to outplay there. So I played c6 because, well, I know my theory pretty good here and knight 2 wasn't a surprise for me. So my strategy in the Philidor defense against knight 2 is always to attack on the queen side. I have here more uh, activity, more space, and I should create my threats there. Ideally, I should also play my bishop here and then put pressure on this e4 pawn in the end of the day once I attack the knight on c3. So that's exactly what I was trying to do. Knight d7, of course, at the same time, I should focus on my development because that is the golden principle and you should always uh, follow it because otherwise nothing is going to work. And it doesn't matter whether you're playing against a 500 rated player or against a super grandmaster. You always must develop your pieces. That is the beauty of those golden principles that no matter what happens, you should always follow it. Because so many players are just not doing it. And I'm not talking only about the beginners, like up to 20, 300 rated players, so often they just forget that they should develop every single one of their pieces. They are just developing a few of them and then start attacking or start uh, executing some ideas, making a lot of moves with the same pieces, and they just not using all of the resources they have. And that is one of the biggest mistakes in chess. So that is what I'm trying to do. Uh, not to do that mistake, I'm castling here. Surprisingly, the engine says it's an inaccuracy. Yeah, it says I could have played h5 and stopped white's activity, but that is yeah somehow next level chess to me. Very difficult move to make because what do I do with my king if I still castle? Then my h5 pawn is always a weakness. That is kind of difficult to play this way. And also, once I play h5, this g5 square is horribly weak, also not what I normally do. So I just castled. Bishop goes to e3, and I'm going a5. When you know the plans, the ideas behind that, then you don't really need to remember all of the moves step by step. Like, I, I don't remember when I should play bishop e7, knight e7, castles, and a5 in the exact order, but I just know that all of those moves have, have to be made. And of course, that could be different depending on what my opponent is doing, because he can start with h3, he can start with bishop e3, bishop g2, and whatever. But if I know my plan very deeply, then I don't care because I still just make sure that my plan works against uh, the specific moves my opponent makes, then I still can go for it. So now the idea is very simple. I want to play b4, uh, maybe open up this file if he takes, put the queen on a8, and then play c5, up, probably after the exchange, and then put pressure on that e4 pawn and eventually win it. So that is a clear plan. Let's see if I manage to execute it. The answer is no, because my opponent plays d5 immediately. He has his counter threat. And he is using that advanced tip that if your opponent attacks you on the side, you should answer in the center. That is how it works in chess. He knows about that, so he is playing d5. Well, I'm taking on d5 because that is allowing me to open up that diagonal, which makes this bishop pretty strong. I mean, I understand it's blocked, but it's always putting pressure on that pawn, and this bishop is just a defender. It's always better to be an attacker rather than a defender. I'm playing here f5 immediately. I'm not afraid to go on because I understand now once that exchange happened, I have here an extra pawn on the king side, and you should normally play 
on the side where you're stronger. Yes, I said in the beginning my plan is to attack on the queen side, but now it's just not possible here anymore. I mean, I can play b4, but there is no knight to attack. Makes no sense, right? So you should adjust your plans. You shouldn't just blindly go for it till the end of the day. You should always keep an eye on the situation on the board. If there is absolutely no uh, sense anymore to attack here, there is absolutely no target there, then maybe I could switch my plan and see on the entire board. It's always very important to keep the entire board uh, in your mind because maybe something has changed, especially when the pawn structure changes. Namely, if one pawn goes to the another line or going off the board, then the pawn structure changes. And then it means, for example, that this pawn on d6 is not weak anymore because, well, the d file is blocked, it's not possible to attack that way. And of course, it means that I have now more pawns on the king side and that fact I can use as well to my advantage because f5 is a free move for me. F4 is going to be possible at some points now, at least that is a move to keep an eye on for white. For example, if you want to move your knight, then F4 becomes a problem. And also, of course, knight F6 is my agenda because that's going to put even more pressure on the pawn and the knight is going to be more active. So there are different ideas, like just get more space. Of course, you should be careful. As long as you move the F pawn, your king becomes more vulnerable. For example, if you imagine this knight happening on E6, that would be a nightmare. That would be resigning pretty much immediately. So, for example, e4 now becomes a huge positional mistake. I mean, you can never afford yourself that move. So, there are some risks, but if you don't make any risk at chess, you're just not winning. It's not possible. So, you have to live with that, but you still have to be active. When you're active, even if you're playing against a very strong opponent, if you are just remaining passive in your camp, sitting there and hoping it's going to work, Please don't do that, because it's not going to work. You still need to be active. Even if you're going to lose, you are still going to learn so much more rather than just, well, trying to be solid and exchange all of the pieces. 99% of the cases, it's not going to work. Imagine how cool it would be to play chess without ever having opening troubles again. What if I told you I could teach you all openings you will ever need in just 10 days? You get lifetime access to more than 110 pure value video tutorials, almost 100 practical tasks to apply your knowledge immediately into practice, 30 plus bonus videos to dive 10 times deeper, as well as private community where all questions you might ever have are answered daily. Get the $200 limited time discount with the link in the description and forget about all opening pain once and for all. So, I'm playing f5, my opponent plays f4, and now I am playing f4. And you remember I just said that that is a position, a horrible positional mistake. But once again, every time the pawn structure, the pawn moves basically, you should adjust your understanding of the position because this f4 square was so important. If I just play, let's say, I don't know, queen d2, I play e4 now, that is just a horrible, horrible move because knight comes to f4, then to e6, and that is huge. But now, once the pawn moves to f4, sorry, here, now e4 is not that bad because there is only one square available for the knight to achieve e6 because f4 is covered now. But if you do that, then d5 becomes vulnerable, so that might be not that dangerous. Even though if you take it immediately, there are some difficulties like knight takes f5 and some craziness going on on the board, like takes g4. I don't want to get into that. I would just mention that the engine says it's not that bad now because I can play queen to c8. This diagonal is blocked and there is no way to play f3 anymore. Like, once again, the pawn structure has changed a lot because if I just play e4 voluntarily before, then I have absolutely nothing. Now, at least I have this uh, protected passer. I'm blocking that bishop and I'm ready to put some pressure on this d5 pawn. So that is something something different. Even though the engine still says that e4 is not the best move, I should have played here knight b6 according to the engine, but that's very tough because once they take, I can never take it. It seems like, yes, I'm attacking the pawn multiple times, everything is great, but there is a move d6 and then I'm losing some material because both bishops are suddenly hanging and I have absolutely no way to save both of them. If I take that guy, he takes here, attacking my queen and the rook, and when I take it back, he takes here and he is a piece up. So instead of that, I should play knight to c4 immediately with a double attack here. And once the bishop is going somewhere, then I can take this pawn because I'm creating a threat of my own. So that is a very crazy variation, just beginning because now b3 and I just don't want to go into that. 
Instead, I played e4 because, well, I'm a fan of a solid pawn structure. When you are sure that you have this passer on e4 that is blocking the bishop and you don't lose immediately, then I'm willing to go for it. My opponent played a4, which as you can see is a mistake according to chess.com. I played b4, which is fine, but even better was to take on a4. That is always a choice, like what to do with this b5 pawn once they play a4. I face it so much, and the problem is every time the right solution might be a different one. Sometimes you want to play b4 because you want to attack that knight on c3, which is typically there, and you just want to control that square, and you don't want to open the position up because, well, Normally white is a little bit more active and then if you open up the position then white gets more chances. But in this particular uh, case it's okay to take here because once they take back we can just play knight b6 with a double attack. I mean that's completely fine. So I played b4, they played c4 and now I took here on c3 because I realized well there is no problem with the d5 pot anymore. If, if I just leave it like that then knight d4 is coming and I have absolutely no counterplay that c4 pawn can be easily protected. And then bishop on b7 is absolutely stupid. You should never do that uh, for your pieces. Just always think of it and uh, look for ways to make it active. And I also thought that as long as this bishop is completely passive there on g2 doing absolutely nothing it's like i have a two bishops advantage which means once again i have to open up the position to make use of those bishops so i took it knight takes here and then i play bishop a6 well the bishop is not doing much as long as the knight is there to protect the pawn i have absolutely no way to win that pawn so i thought the bishop the bishop is more active on a6 it's a move with a tempo and besides i have this move knight c5 and now the knight is coming to d3 that felt like a dream for me. So I'm executing that plan, rook d2, and now I'm absolutely shocked. Like, how on earth can you stop from coming to d3? That feels like a lifetime opportunity here. The knight is just a monster supported by the pawn, supported by the bishop, just blocking all of the white pieces, cementing the the black's advantage here seemingly, but it turns out it's just a huge mistake. Can't you imagine that? I mean, I couldn't resist from making that move, so I made it immediately. But, well, the right move was just bishop f6, improving your position first, making this bishop very powerful, and the knight still is here, well, having some ideas, maybe this, this rook is coming, and then knight b3 is a threat, and, and the bishop is still opened. And the problem is knight d3, uh, the reason why it's a mistake is because White suddenly can just sacrifice the piece here. And it's not that obvious. What do you get in the end of the day? Yes, you are free in your bishop. Remember, I was talking that this bishop is horribly passive. Well, now it's basically the best piece that White has here because uh, the knight is under attack, the bishop is keeping an eye on the h stone pawn, and uh, once again, the madness begins here. Like, takes, takes, and yeah, queen h5, some checkmate in idea, g6. Yeah, actually, the engine says, well, no worries here, it's just a draw with a perpetual check, but you know, the engine he always does something crazy like that. So, let's go back to the real game. My opponent haven't figured it out, and I have to say, in the Blitz game, it's not that simple to figure it out. He played bishop f1 instead, but now, actually, black is much better. Now I'm playing this bishop f6 move, the bishop is great, but rook b1, the position is still incredibly complicated and I should have just continued my development, maybe put in the rook there, maybe put in the queen. But what I did instead was um, knight takes b2 immediately and I, I sort of wanted to cash in immediately. And sometimes you shouldn't do that. You should just enjoy your position, you should just sit on it and improve it. Like bring in your queen, bring in your rook and then maybe bring another rook, activating every single one of your pieces and only then you should come with uh, some active uh, actions. But I decided to do it immediately, and that is not that desirable, at least according to the engine, because now white has some activity. Before, like, just look at those pieces. They, this rook does absolutely nothing. This rook does absolutely nothing as long as before is not possible, and yeah, it doesn't seem to be possible for the time being. And I mean, all of the pieces are extremely passive. This bishop is doing absolutely nothing. It, it can take, but then my bishop comes and you only need to sacrifice the exchange probably. So white is absolutely passive. But once I do that, yes, I win a pawn, but the cost I have to pay for that is activating pretty much all of my opponent's pieces. Because look at this open B file, look at those open bishops. All of that happened because I just was too greedy and took that pawn. So 
be very careful with exchanging your initiative advantage for the material advantage because sometimes that pawn is not worth it. So I did it anyway because, well, the position is still better for black and, well, it's a blitz game so I wanted to secure my pawn advantage. I thought this pawn, which is actually the extra pawn if you take a look at the board, this one is a passer. We have same color bishops. I don't have any huge threats that are coming at me. So this position should be fantastic. I am playing against the top grandmaster, so of course, well, you have this feeling that you want to simplify it a little bit just to reduce the possibility of you making mistakes. It's not always the best strategy and objectively it's not the best one, but you don't want to spoil this chance, right? So you do that. So queen to b5, I played rook c8, I activated the piece, this one, absolutely logical, the best move. And rook c6. Of course, my opponent is not allowing me to go forward somewhere here or here, making my uh, rook a monster. So he goes there, I play rook to b8, and then I play bishop c5. What's even better is that basically it's a double threat here, and I'm attacking both the rook and the bishop. He can't just stay here because I'm gonna take here uh, on e3, position zook, and then I'm just winning the piece. So he has to go away, so I'm basically winning that uh, tempo here. Of course, he also cannot take the bishop because rook takes b1 check. But then I have rook b4, another move with the tempo. The more moves with the tempo you're making, the better it is for you, the more activity you get. Of course, it works only in the case when it's a useful move for you. Don't make a tempo move just for a sole purpose of making a tempo move, because sometimes it's just making your position worse, not better. You should combine, ideally, improving your position with creating uh, a threat for your opponent. That is what's called a tempo move. My opponent plays queen to c3, and now I can take and get another pawn, so I was absolutely thrilled with this position. I have two extra pawns, and, just, and I just know I don't need to spoil it because so many times I had absolutely fantastic positions against insanely strong players but then at some point yeah normally towards the end of the game or when it's all going crazy I just somehow lose the entire advantage lose the entire game and that feels devastating afterwards so I just wanted to make sure that I secured this victory so rook is on First of all, there is absolutely no victory for me just yet because checkmate in one is coming. I have to do something about it. So I played queen f6. Of course, that is also a double purpose move. I mean, I'm dealing with a threat, but at the same time, I create a threat of my own because exchanging the queens is perfect for me. And also, I'm activating my queen, so I'm improving my position. That is what I'm talking about, that multi-purpose multi moves that you should try to make in your games as often as possible. My opponent takes, and now we are getting in the Ruxan game, and I thought, well, first of all, I can never lose it, because I have two pawns up, if I lose this position, I mean, what of a chess player am I? Secondly, the more pieces are going off the board, the less dangerous it is for me in terms of getting some checkmating attacks, and if there are no checkmated ideas for why, then it's becoming just a technical position when I have to convert my advantage. Let's see how I manage to do that. My opponent plays rook a7, which is of course the best move, putting your rook behind the passer. Always do that, no matter whether it's your passer or your opponent's passer. I would be happy to change this uh, rook's position, vice versa, because then my rook supports the pawn, whereas my opponent's rook is just blocking it. Now, the more forward I go, the more difficult it is for my rook, because it's getting less and less squares to have. Okay, so I play h5, well, it creates a loop for the king and maybe putting some pressure over here, maybe h4 is going to be possible, so my opponent plays h4 immediately. I play rook f7, well, I would be happy once again to exchange a pair of rooks, that would simplify my uh, uh, task a lot. I'm playing rook b7 now, basically sacrificing, because I have a huge idea in mind, I just want to checkmate my opponent or make him uh, put his rook on a passive position and then g3 is going to be weak as well. That is exactly what happens here. So you can always use those opportunities to make your pieces more active. It's all about the pieces activity. Like even the fact that I have two extra pawns doesn't really help me if I, be, if I stay too passive here. Like how on earth are you gonna win? This rook has to be here to protect, this rook has to be here to protect, so you're not making any progress, that's not the way. And eventually your opponent might become somehow active here, maybe create some threats for you, and you can be in trouble, so you can never remain passive. Doesn't matter if you are some material less or you some material up, 
Anyway, you have to be active. So rook b2, and then just rook a3, and there is absolutely no way to save that pawn, and also it's hanging with a check. Well, there is one, actually. Rook g6, but that runs into king to f7, and then you have to decide whether you play rook g5, but that, this rook is just in prison now after the move g6, you can just completely forget about it. Or you go away, uh, that happened in the game, rook a6, but then you lose that g3 pawn, and that's not going to be the only pawn you're going to lose. And I'm very greedy, especially in the end game. If I can get a lot of pawns, a lot of material, I go for it. Well, I cannot really be punished for that, so why not? So king h1, I'm going for rook h3 check, and now another check. Uh, I'm taking the pawn on f4, and basically there is no pawns for white left except for this d pawn. Of course, it was essential for me to stop that pawn from promoting, but I calculated the variations and I hoped it's gonna work for me because I have here rook d3 and rook d3. I'm just blocking that file. I'm threatening to um, to take here on d1, obviously, and I'm in time with my king to stop that pawn. For example, if you play rook d5, I can just take one of the rooks and then king a8 and I'm in time. Well, whenever I'm in time, I'm out of danger and then I have 27 extra pawns and that would be easy for me to convert the advantage. If I wouldn't be just one tempo short here, if d7 would be possible, then of course white is winning the game. So it's always very important to make sure that you stop your opponent passers. So rook d3, he took it here and played rook d5 and I'm still executing the same idea. He doesn't play d7, so I'm playing king to d7 myself. I don't really care how many pawns I'm gonna be left with as long as, well, it's more than one, basically. So I'm playing g5, I have three connected passers here and I also have that a pawn which I used to my advantage because, well, if I already have it, why not to push it? At least that is a deflection, so my opponent's rook has to go away and for example I can just get this pawn here, but I thought, well, I can uh, also just protect it first and then took it and now I have uh, three extra pawns, but well, a lot of passers on the different sides of the boards, which makes it even more difficult for my opponent to stop all of that. Then I need to activate my king. The king is an incredibly important asset in the endgame. So many low-rated players don't understand that. They're just basically not using their king in the endgame or don't use it enough. So in the opening, as well as in the middle game, your task for the king is to make sure it's as safe as possible. But in the endgame, the situation changes dramatically because now there is no danger to get checkmated, so you should use your king as an active piece to go forward, to create some threats for your opponent, to protect your stuff, and, well, to make sure you win the game. So I'm playing king b6, and once again there is an unpleasant choice. Either you go somewhere here and then the a pawn goes forward, or you go somewhere here along the a file, but then the king goes forward. Both is not desirable for uh, white, but you cannot stop both. So I'm going forward with my king. Once I'm getting to the second rank, I get a chance to block the checks with my rook, basically block the file, and then after king b2, there is absolutely no way to stop that pawn from promoting, so my opponent resigned here. So that is one of the biggest victories of my entire chess career, because I beat the super grandmaster here. Now in this video I embarrassed myself totally because I played such a horrible game, I just blundered everything there was to blunder against a very famous YouTube uh, chess player, but then at the end of the day something absolutely crazy happened and I won that game. You are gonna be, <laughs> you are gonna be amazed by it, definitely take a look.